condemning them because they were actually... because they were actually closer to him in their beliefs than any other group. Much that the writer said was true, but his perspective and conclusions were false. Our Lord indeed was harshest towards the Pharisees, whom he called whited sepulchres, serpents, vipers, blind guides, hypocrites, and more. Matthew twenty-three twenty-three to 33 The Pharisees came to hear Jesus, at first hoping to hear him damn everybody else, only to hear him damn them. They did believe in the word of God, but they believed it was good for everyone other than themselves. The Pharisees were the strictest believers in all Judea, and they were also the most moral. They were proud of their superiority, and they took credit for it. As a result, their pride in the purity of their faith led them to censoriousness, to contempt for others, and to a belief that others were standing in the need for prayer rather than they themselves. Jesus shocked the Pharisees by condemning them most, and the people who professed most to be God's people ended up crucifying the Lord of glory. Their faith had at last shown its evil fruits. Okay, we've got some background noise there. Okay, well, it should be all right, because you come out in the wash. Fourteen, in praise of strong language. A very unpleasant and ungodly woman once told me, a Christian must be nice to everybody. What she meant was that I had to take her nasty credit. I had to take. I had to take her. What she meant was. What she meant was that I had to take her nasty criticisms and yet be sweet to her. Was she right? A minister tried to tell me within the past week that we should all be like Jesus, who, according to this minister, loved everybody and never had an unkind word for anyone or ever indulged in name-calling. Was he right? Not according to the Bible. Jesus called Herod that fox, Luke 13, 32. He called the Pharisees hypocrites, blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, whited sepulchres, serpents, and a generation of vipers. Matthew 23, 23-33, and much more. On one occasion, he even called Peter Satan. Matthew 6, 23-23. Matthew 16, 23, for counselling a wrong course of action. Nor is strong, blunt language lacking in the prophets and apostles. The Bible rings out with strong condemnation of a great many persons as well as nations and sins as well as sinners. Neither Jesus Christ nor the Bible is nice to everybody, nor can we be without sin. The Bible's strong language does not represent sin or weakness on the part of the prophets, apostles or Jesus Christ. Their anger is righteous anger and their plain, blunt language is godly indignation and righteous judgment. One of the sins of our age is the lack of strong language where evil is concerned. Nothing seemed to be called by its right name these days. Murderers are called freedom fighters, and revolutionary mobs are called deprived and underprivileged people whom we must subsidise. Hoodlums are called victims of their environment, and so on. Because of the inability of many to face facts plainly, they are easily imposed on by knaves and fools. Evil and foolish persons are tolerated, allowed to take up time and attention and hamper godly men and women. We cannot deal with evil unless we first of all face up to it for what it is and call it by its right name. We have, we've had. We have had too much nicey nice from politicians and preachers. It's high time to use some blunt, plain and strong language and then, by the grace of God, to take steps against the powers of evil. We cannot win a battle until we first of all recognise that we are at war. We need more strong language, strong deeds and strong men. God give us such men.
15. Spiritual arson. One of the Bible's strongest statements has to do with speech, with the tongue. Our Lord's brother James tells us that speech is a killing power like fire, and the tongue is set on fire of, or by, hell. The tongue of fallen man communicates, quote, a world, or literally in Greek, a cosmos of iniquity. While men can tame wild animals, quote, the tongue can no man tame, end quote. It is, quote, an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. James 3, 3 to 12. The old saying, sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but angry words can never, is not true. More people are hurt by words than by sticks and stones. Too many people who are said to be converted have unconverted tongues. Major and chronic problems in churches arise from hurtful things said. It is the God-ordained duty of pastors to confront sinners, to hear their confessions, and to correct and guide them. This sometimes requires blunt words. The pastor does this with authority. The congregation does not have an authority to talk, pass judgment, gossip, and generally manifest an untamed tongue. Its speech must be governed by the Holy Spirit. James said of speech, The tongue is a little member. Behold how great a matter or wood, a little fire. A little fire kindleth. James is saying that gossiping can be a form of spiritual arson. An arsonist destroys something he has no right to destroy. Instead of being a builder, he is a destroyer. The last thing churches need are arsonists. Don't be one. All right. All right. I just said, come on. Confess I on. Sixteen. Confession. I felt heartsick the other day when I heard that a husband had confessed his sins to everyone's great joy except his wife. Except. To everyone's great joy except his wife's. It was a general confession. Now, a general confession is legitimate, but by an individual, a specific confession is necessary. People often say, I'm sorry because they are caught or in deep trouble, but only because they regret the results of their sins. A true confession of sin is specific. All of us sinners, in one way or another, to say that we are sorry for our sins does not mean much. Un <laughs> not good enough. All of us are sinners in one way or another. To say that we are sorry for our sins does not mean much unless we specify the sin which is the present problem. This means confronting our actual sin and our guilt. It means dealing with the facts, not vague generalizations. There is no genuine repentance apart from specific confession of sin. A general confession of sin by an individual is simply admitting one's status as a human being. A specific confession is a recognition of one's own transgressions against the Lord and against various people, and without this there is not true repentance. Thus, when someone, whether a child or an adult, says, I'm sorry, we need to ask, sorry for what? Until we get a specific answer with... Until we get a specific answer, the confession is worthless. All right. Seventeen. Cowardly church members. It happened again. Pastor more than a thousand miles away is a good friend whom I see once or twice a year. His congregation knows of our friendship. A few people in the church are unhappy over a trifling matter involving the way this pastor does certain things. What do they do? They have two honest choices. First, they can speak to him about it, graciously and kindly. 
second, they can look at the total picture and recognize that their pastor is one of the best anywhere, and a minor fault is worth overlooking. However, both of these choices require character and also grace. Instead, they take a third choice. They telephone someone who is a neighbouring state where I am speaking and ask them to speak to the man who will meet me at the airport and ask him to ask me to speak to their pastor. It sounds crazy, and it is. It's also sinful. It is a demand for a perfection which these people themselves lack. It's a violation of God's law against tailbearing. Leviticus 19.16 And it is a request that I join them in their cowardice and sin. With members like this, is it any wonder that the church is weak? Who but a fool will criticise a sergeant on a battlefield for not wearing a tie? We are at war with humanism against God's enemies. Stop fighting with God's soldiers and officers or the Lord... Stop fighting, stop fighting... Stop fighting with God's soldiers and officers, or the Lord God will declare war on you. Right. 18. About pastors. Earlier this year, a friend of our small but active Christian foundation donated his 1974 Mark IV Continental to us for our work. It kept it in superb condition, almost showroom polish, added new Michelin tyres all around, and had it thoroughly checked. Naturally, it's a pleasure to drive. The car is also an interesting religious barometer. From time to time, as I travel up and down the States, someone will comment about the car and its condition and ask me about my work. Sometimes I tell them I'm a writer, which I am, and the author of 25 to 30 books, all currently in print. They're impressed. Some will tell me about foreign cars, very expensive ones I have rarely seen, which they think I should be interested in. At other times, I tell them that I'm a minister, which I am, still preaching and speaking all over the country. This answer makes some of them unpleasant and even angry. Some who call themselves good Christians talk resentfully of rich preachers. Now the Bible tells us that the labourer is worthy of his... Oh, no, this is not good. Not good. The labourer is worthy of his reward, and that those who labour well in the ministry of the word and doctrine are worthy of double honour, which means double pay. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Too many church members act as though God never said that. A very fine pastor went to a small struggling church here in California at a cut-in salary. At a cut-in salary, went to his... What? Oh, that's a so laddie da. A very fine pastor went to a small, struggling church here in California at a cut-in salary because he felt much could be done here. His wife went to work. He put in long hours as a pastor, building up the membership and as a carpenter doing the finishing work on the new building. Then, after several years... He asked for a salary he felt he was earning and which the church could pay. Board members opposed it on the grounds that he would make more than they did. All too many church members act as though poverty is a virtue in pastors, missionaries and Christian school teachers. They dishonour the Lord by dishonouring his servants. Take a good look at yourself. Would you be resentful if your pastor could live better than you do? If so, don't call your attitude anything other than what it is, sin and envy, and it does not commend you to the Lord. I feel like I'm phoning this in, folks, you know. Nineteen. The Departing Pastor A pastor telephoned recently, not to ask for counsel, but simply to have someone to talk to. He's leaving his pastoral charge after six very successful years. A moderate church in size when he arrived, it has grown substantially. Visitors come from miles away to hear him, and the church, while having new buildings, must now plan on much larger facilities. The congregation loves him and is proud of their church. 
and he's leaving to start a mission work in a small community in another state. Why? I couldn't take it any longer, he told me. They want to be big, important and successful, not useful to the Lord. When the pastor, soon after arriving, asked for a Christian school, the church voted it down, then and each year since. When he suggested organising the woman for a ministry of help, one day a month for each volunteer to the many elderly shut-ins, they told him that, with their present growth after their new building project, they could add someone to the staff for that purpose. All they want, said the pastor, is good preaching, no application, a good centre for the families of the church, no concern beyond themselves. What we have, he told me, is an important Bible-living community centre, not an army for Jesus Christ, and they will not change. As a result, he's leaving to start a new work, and a Christian school is part of it. I'm sure the congregation will be bewildered. They will offer him more, not stopping to think that he is leaving to take much less. They will never understand until they face up to the key question, is the church there to serve me and my family, or my community, or to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm very happy with the waveform, but I know I could be doing a bit better. 20. Double honour. Already this year I have made several trips back and forth across the country, and I am still continually amazed at how indulgent church members are of ungodly and unbelieving pastors, and how heartless so often towards godly and able pastors. In one church, for example, a board member, an envious, incompetent man, blocked a raise for the pastor on the ground that the minister would then make more than he did. Too many words, too little time. Blocked a raise for a pastor on the ground that the minister would then make more than he did. He actually believed this was a good argument. Yet this sanctimonious reprobate professed to believe the Bible from cover to cover. St. Paul says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. What this means is simply that it is a law of God that muzzling an ox is wrong. The worker deserves a fair return for his work. Those who labour faithfully and effectually in the ministry of the word of God, they'll make up the words. Those who labour faithfully and effectually in the ministry of the word of doctrine deserve double honour or pay. Not too many years ago, a church manse was finished with furnace. I know all about it. Not too many years ago, a church manse was furnished with discarded furniture from the homes of members, and the pastor's family was given hand-me-down clothes. People sanctimoniously felt virtuous, being stingy towards God. Things have improved since then, but not much. Most people still give the leftovers of their lives to God and to the church, yet they wonder why the church declines and the country disintegrates. How would you like if you were paid for... How would you like? How would you like? How would you like if... It, how would you like it? How would you like it? Speak! Bubble-a-boo! They wonder why... How would you like it if you were paid with leftovers? And how do you think God views the leftovers of your life? If you expect God to appreciate you, you're not only a sinner but a fool. If we deny God, he denies us joy in all that we keep. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. Agai 1 6. If we do not honour God's faithful servants, it's because we do not first of all honour God.
21. Blindness I remember, back in Depression years, a pastor who was an incredibly bad preacher. He was successful only because he was an exceptionally good money-raiser, and there are too many churches always that prefer money to grace, because money spells beautiful buildings and facilities. One elderly pastor once observed that the worst punishment in hell for this money-raising pastor would be an eternity spent listening to his own sermons. Well, he was wrong. About ten years or so later, this incompetent preacher brought a tape recorder and began to tape his own preaching as some kind of self-test. I was told that he listened to his own sermons and voice with rapture and delight. When men, and st when men are stone blind... When men are stone blind, turning up the lights will not help them. When men are cold and dead in their sins and trespasses, medicine will not revive them. They need the regenerating... <laughs> they need the regenerating... They need the regenerating... They need the regenerating power of God in Jesus Christ. Isaiah describes the blindness of his generation and of all godless men in these words. We group the wall like the blind and we group as if we have no eyes. We stumble at noonday as if in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. Isaiah 59.10 The blindness of Isaiah's day preceded judgment. That successful pastor was a blind man, and there are many like him in every walk of life. They have no awareness of their condition, nor any knowledge of their destiny of death. Many things displease them, but not their blindness. In such a society, Isaiah tells us, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Isaiah 59.15 But it doesn't end there. The spiritually blind have no future. The righteous do suffer, but they triumph also, because we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8.37 To be blind at the edge of a cliff means no fear as we walk, but it also means no life. whoop de doo Let's go! 22. The Test of Preaching Charles Haddon Spurgeon is commonly recognized as one of the greatest preachers of all time. It's important to remember that, in his own day, the 19th century, many people disliked and resented his plain-spoken preaching. Spurgeon never soft-pedaled anything God's Word declared, and this, to many, was offensive. They felt that a preacher should only inspire and uplift people, never shake them up, as Spurgeon did. Spurgeon did have a time. Spurgeon did have a knack for timely and hard hitting sentences, as for example his statement that many church members reminded him of his neighbour's pigs, all grunt and no bacon. A pastor once invited Spurgeon to preach for him during his absence one Sunday. The congregation was very upset over this. When Spurgeon arrived, no one greeted him or opened up the pastor's study. Spurgeon placed his hat and coat in the pulpit chair. Since the offering that day was to go to Spurgeon, the offering plates had been hidden by the deacons. For the offertory, Spurgeon handed his hat to the usher. No one placed even a halfpenny onto the hat. When the smirking ushers returned the hat to Spurgeon to... What a bunch of absolute glipes. When the smirking ushers returned the hat to Spurgeon for offertory prayer, Spurgeon's prayer was a very simple one. Lord, I thank thee that these tight wads give me back my hat. <laughs> then he preached the word of God to them. Then, as now, there are many who say to the Lord's servants, 
speak unto us smooth things. Isaiah 30.10 They want all preaching. They want all preaching. They want all preaching to please them. They want all preaching to please them when it should rather be pleasing to the Lord. The test of good preaching is simply... I didn't... You didn't hear that, did you? The test of good preaching is very simply... Is God pleased with it? Or is man... In the shirt at tonight... Okie doke. Alrighty. Mummified Christian. Mama. 23. 23. 23. Mummified Christians. General William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, was a remarkable man with a devastating way of saying things. He believed emphatically that Faith without works is dead, James 2.26. He regarded churches that did not produce working Christians as mortuaries. In fact, he said, all too many church members are mummy Christians. They are mummified, and mummies are incapable of it. They're mummified and mummies are incapable of action. Except for occupying space in the church, such members do little to apply the faith. Hard language? Well, Charles Spurgeon said too many church members reminded him of his neighbour's pigs. All grunt and no bacon. Some other great Christian leaders have used equally strong language. Are such judgments true? And if they are, can we not believe that our Lord will use even harsher language on the Day of Judgment? About 50 years ago, a Bible school teacher made his class spend several days listing all the words of our Lord in two categories. One, words of love and encouragement, and two, words of wrath and judgment. To the class's surprise, the second list was far longer. Our Lord, who knows what is in man, knows what is in us. We all love the word of praise, but perhaps what we need is the word of judgment to wake us up out of our indifference and laziness. Share it tonight. 24. 24. Is the church obsolete? Is the church obsolete? The answer clearly is that many churches are. The basic definition of the word obsolete is gone out of use. Not too many years ago, a horse and buggy were necessary on most farms. Today, they are obsolete, and for much farming, even a barn is obsolete also. They have no real function or purpose in terms of the necessities of farm life today. Is the same true of the church? The church is, by the definition of the Bible, the body of Christ, made up of his members, governed by his word, and ordained officers, and called together for worship by the preaching of the word of God and the administration of the sacraments. According to the Bible, the church does not belong to man, but to Jesus Christ. It is his possession, called to serve him and fulfill him. Ugh. I hate that. Called to serve him and fulfill his purposes. The church is obsolete when it fails to do that. In fact, the church is not a church when it fails to fulfill Christ's purposes. When the church becomes an agency for propagating unbelief, when it denies the basic doctrines of the faith, it is obsolete. When a church joins forces with social revolution, when it champions lawlessness, rioting, and the organized... Rioting and the organized assault on the property rights of farmers and businessmen, the church is obsolete. Of every false church, Jesus Christ says, I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 2.16 
His promise to false churches is one of sharp judgments. Revelation 2.23 In Christ's eyes, false churches are obsolete, of no use to him, and therefore to be destroyed. If Christ, according to his word, regards false churches as obsolete, as useless to him, we have no right to treat them differently. We cannot stand with a church that has abandoned Jesus Christ and expect him to bless and defend us. Even a prominent leftist, Michael Harrington, recently protested against the church's position today. While agreeing with their revolutionary political ideas, he declared that, quote, They still have an obligation to talk about their old theological hero, God. If they are unwilling to do that, they should take off their robes and discard the ceremonial paraphernalia and come out into the secular cold with the rest of us. Otherwise, the... Wise man. Astute man. Otherwise, the crosses are so much costume jewellery. Harrington concluded, quote, and so my radical advice to these radical religionists is, God should go to church, and maybe he shouldn't hang around with the bar so much. And maybe he shouldn't hang around the bar so much. Not only the cross, but the entire form of the church is simply, quote, so much costume jewellery, end quote, for most clergymen today. They use the form of the church to promote the substance of a socialist revolution. They use the form of the preaching of God's word to issue propaganda for political and economic causes that are hostile to biblical faith. St. Paul describes these infiltrators into the church as traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. 2 Timothy 3, 4 and 5 as far as Christ is concerned, such a church and such a clergy is obsolete. It has lost its usefulness to him. But a church that is useless and yet is still thriving must then have some great use for someone else. Although it's obsolete for Christ, the church is obviously useful to Christ's enemies. All right, folks, I'm doing my best here. So hopefully I'll get another couple done today. But thanks for tuning in. And thanks for being with me. Thank you for being a friend and a confidant and going down the road and back again. Appreciate that. Okay, so if you want to support this work, uh, you can do so by going to nathanteacher.com and clicking on the donate button. So I say 